Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Welcome to the National Press Club and today's Westpac address. Well, we've just over one week till the federal parliament winds down for the year, what's been a hectic year, and uh, our federal parliamentarians go back to their electorates for the summer break, of course. When parliament does resume uh, early next year in February, one of the first items of business will be introducing legislation to establish a, a rural health commissioner. The commissioner was promised during the election campaign by the coalition, indeed by the Nationals deputy, deputy leader and minister for regional development, Fiona Nash. The rural health commissioner will work with health and medical experts and specialists in an effort to improve quality of service, to fill workforce gaps and to address what is one of the pressing issues uh, impacting on Australia, rural and regional health. Today we're very fortunate to have at the National Press Club three experts in their field to discuss the role that the Commissioner should play, to discuss and debate the needs, the priorities that uh, many of the people in this room are familiar with, but our broader audience uh, wrestle with every day, particularly those who live in regional and remote Australia. So we are very, very delighted to have as I said, three experts in their field to discuss this particular issue. Jerry Malone is chair of the National Rural Health Alliance. Janine Muhammad is chief executive of the Congress of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander Nurses and Midwives. And last but not least, Martin Laverty is the chief executive of the Royal Flying Doctor Service of Australia. They'll bring their own unique insights into this particular issue. Jerry Malone will uh, address the club first. Please welcome Jerry Malone. Thank you, Steve, for the introduction. And it is a great opportunity for the National Rural Health Alliance to be able to provide this spotlight on rural and remote health. I would like to begin by paying my respects to the traditional owners of this land on which we meet, the Ngunnawal and the Gambi people, to their elders past and present and to future generations. And I would like to acknowledge Auntie Matilda House, who's here with us today. I want to tell you a story. Imagine yourself in a small remote town, population 250, with a broader district population difficult to quantify than covering that vast geographical area, predominantly agricultural based, some mining activities and tourism. The town has a school and a health clinic, a pub, some other small businesses and a police presence. The health clinic is staffed by a remote area nurse with fly-in, fly-out medical and allied health services. The nearest, more substantial town with a population of 3,500 has more services and a hospital, including birthing services, but is 400 kilometres away. Royal Flying Doctor Service provides a weekly primary health care clinic with medical and nursing services and responds to local emergencies. Allied health services are provided on a fly-in, fly-out as needs basis. The capital city is a thousand kilometres away. The relieving remote area nurse flew in on the regular, not daily, commercial flight to receive a handover from the nurse who was leaving on that outgoing flight. During that face-to-face -face handover, they discussed an ongoing situation with a specific patient, culminating with the plan that that patient was going to fly out under the departing nurse's escort. This situation had been managed over a period of time in consultation with a whole network of other health professionals. The patient was a 12-year-old boy who I will call Max, who had been exhibiting antisocial behaviour, disruptive, explosive bursts of anger, had threatened other kids and also threatened self-harm. He had a history of other similar incidents but never to this extent. Incidentally, the local mental health service is one mental health worker in that closest, biggest town, 400 kilometres away, a solo outreach position from the main regionally based service, which is another 300 kilometres away. So this seemed like a good plan, but unfortunately Max was not happy to go. He exhibited behaviour which was considered to be an in-flight risk, and so that was abandoned. This left the incoming nurse to manage the situation and also a very distressed and angry mother upset on the day's outcomes after all this negotiation and consultation and an also sedated son. So the, birth, the nurse booked another urgent telehealth consult with the city-based team 
and was informed that a paediatric retrieval team from the city was being sent out who would further manage the situation and transfer Max to the paediatric union in the city. However, that team flew in, assessed the situation, decided they didn't want to do that and flew out again. The remote area nurse, who was a very experienced remote area nurse, I might say, by this time, needless to say, felt totally abandoned, but more so for the patient and his family. So due to her diligence, persistence and her commitment to the patient and the family and the community, she found some emergency funding that could be accessed to assist the family to drive out. Not ideal situation, but a solution. So it took 10 days from the time of the original incident until Max received the appropriate assessment and intervention from a child mental health team. Was that a fair result for Max and his family? <coughs> Unfortunately, this story will resonate with many rural and remote-based health professionals, clients and families, reflective of the inadequacy of health services, not just a lack of resources often, but the fragmentation, highly time-consuming, web and maze to find a solution that presents itself to remote and rural health professionals every day. I want to mention here the importance of telehealth. The access to the mental health workers through this medium are highly valued and are a critical link. But it is equally important to say to you that telehealth is not the panacea that many funders and city-based bureaucrats would like to think it is. It only goes so far and is not and must not be seen as a replacement for on-the-ground services, but merely an adjunct. The National Rural Health Alliance is well positioned to inform this discussion on rural and remote health. As a 39-member organisation, we all have a common goal to improve the health outcomes for people living and working in rural and remote Australia. Our members encompass all the professional workforce organisations across the spectrum, health service providers such as the Royal Flying Doctor Service, key Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander workforce organisations, along with important consumer groups such as the Country Women's Association, Isolated Children's Parents Association, reflecting the importance of encompassing all the elements contributing to health and wellbeing. Good health is essential for good productive life. Evidence supports that and we all know that. If we can reduce the disparities in health and wellbeing between people in rural and remote areas of, and people in metropolitan areas, we can dramatically improve participation and productivity and hence Australia's economic growth. Access to affordable, appropriate health service is a basic human right. I'm not talking about specialised medical and surgical and cardiac services here, but essential primary health care services, emergency responses including mental health and being able to birth and die close to where you live. For a long time now we've been highlighting the fractured nature of the health service delivery that exists between layers of government and provision of service contracts to different organisations that are not coordinated and do not necessarily meet the needs of the community. Models that work in urban settings do not necessarily translate to the rural and remote sector. We need flexible arrangements to provide the services communities need. Local solutions for local issues using local knowledge. Access to health services, as we all know, is dependent upon many factors, including an appropriate workforce. Not of any one professional group, but a team, whereby the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health worker, the aged care worker, the mental health professional, optometrists, dentists, ambulance people, speech therapists, podiatrists, they're all as equally vital as is the doctor. We do not have a health worker shortage in this country at the current time. But what we do have is a distribution problem. We don't seem to be able to get them out of the cities. As a health professional, I consider myself very fortunate to have had worked across rural and remote Australia in a variety of roles, nursing and midwifery. I am also representative of what we know, having grown up in rural South Australia, that I am more likely to go back and work in that environment. We must focus on growing our own workforce. Unfortunately, there tends to be a bit of an attitude that to work in rural remote health, regardless of which professional group you're in, you're a bit lower in the pecking order. You couldn't possibly cut it in the city, so you go bush. But we know the reality is really quite different. That in order to succeed in rural and remote health, you have to be a special kind of person. As a generalist role, you need to be adaptable, resourceful, 
self-motivated and competent across a very broad scope of practice. You need to be in tune with your community and you need to be resilient. And it is a fabulous career, which many people in this room will attest to. Australians generally will attest that they have a strong affinity with the bush. They like to romanticise the lifestyle, reinforce the myths and promote the romantic images of the bush, where there are cubras and their moleskins when the occasion dictates, including politicians. <laughs> I suggest that that connection is superficial. Scratch the surface and the actual investment in services, be they health, education, communications and business, is sometimes tokenistic at best. We need to do better. One size, one approach does not fit all. Seven million people and kids like 12-year-old Max deserve better. We need a fair go for rural and remote health. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Please welcome Janine Mahan. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, elders and dignitaries, in particular the Honourable Warren Snowden, good friend of Cat's name. Thank you for your very warm welcome and thank you all for being here and for watching from home. I'd like to start by paying my respects to the traditional custodians of the land, the Ngunnawal and the Ngambri peoples, and to elders past, present and future emerging generations, in particular Aunty Matilda House. I am a proud Narangagana woman which means I'm from the York Peninsula in South Australia. More specifically, a place called Point Pierce Mission. Hello to my family at home. I'd like to start with a pe personal story about one of the reasons I chose to become a nurse. When I was a young girl growing up in country SA, we lived next door to the director of nursing from our local hospital. In our home, we always had more than our fair share of sick people, our fair share of illness, and Mr Walker often came over to help us. He built the health literacy in our home. He wasn't an Aboriginal man, yet he saw colour. He respected our difference and he didn't judge us. Our family often enjoyed a laugh with him and we built a relationship founded on mutual respect and trust and we can only ever travel at the speed of trust. When I look back, I recognise that he embodied a term called cultural safety and respect long before the practice had ever been invented. He supported us to make the best use of our family's human resources without bias. When I was seven years old, he told me I would make a good nurse because I was smart and because I was kind. He didn't underestimate me. He encouraged me to see beyond the mountain to see what I could be. What he gave me was the capacity to make sure I didn't waste the resources I had, but to make the best use of them. And that's the message I would like governments to take on board today. Stop the waste and barriers. Make use of a great asset, the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nurses and midwives and all of our Indigenous health professionals. I often like to begin my speeches by speaking about a great pioneering Aboriginal nurse, May Yarrowick. May trained in obstetric nursing in Sydney in 1903. Imagine that, an Aboriginal nurse treating and caring for both Aboriginal and non-Aboriginal peoples in this era. And she may well be our first Aboriginal woman qualified in Western nursing. We now have over 3,000 Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander nurses and midwives working across this great country. When I think of May, I'm reminded of the incredible service that our health professionals provide to our people living in rural, remote and regional Australia. It's a service built on the knowledge of our people who undertook the roles of health professionals for thousands of years before the first formal health school was ever set up. The importance of our workforce in closing in the gap must not be underestimated. Evidence shows that our people respond best when they are treated and supported by Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander health professionals. A strong and growing Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander health workforce not only provides better quality of care, but it also provides role modelling to our people. It also provides life-changing jobs for our people in rural, remote and regional communities and improves the health literacy in homes, communities, families. 
unfortunately, continued waste and short-term vision of government bureaucracy sadly contributes to the lack in closing the gap. Each year our sector invests an obscene amount of time and effort arguing for the renewal of our funding contracts. This diverts frontline staff from their jobs and I can tell you is a real killer for job satisfaction. It also sends a terrible message to our workforce about their own security and value. So policies that help grow and support the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health workforce, less bureaucracy and longer term funding arrangements for our organisations is the low hanging fruit that can be done to close the gap. But these aren't the only answers. While we're growing our own workforce, we need to make sure that all health professionals operate in a culturally safe way with Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. We need health professionals like Mr Walker, who see colour, see our culture, see our difference and respect it. Health professionals that understand the impact of racism, poverty and dispossession on health outcomes. Health professionals capable of addressing their own biases and the biases that underline the systems in which they work. In New Zealand, legislation requires all health professionals to be trained in and demonstrate culturally safe and respectful practices. We are lagging behind in our country to do the same. Let me give you another area where the health system fails to support our rural, remote and regional families when support is most necessary when a new baby arrives. The birth of a baby, I'm sure you'll agree, is a special time and birthing period is critical for forming lifelong trajectories in health. That's why, together with the Australian College of Midwives and Crowner Plus, we've been calling on governments to support women to give birth on country, in communities where they live, surrounded by their loved ones. A woman I'm so proud to call my friend, Miss Jarpri Manangreet, articulated the meaning of birthing on country to be a metaphor for the best start in life for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander babies and families, which provides an appropriate transition to motherhood and parenting. So, there is no cookie cutter approach to the term birthing on country, but what is common for everyone is that they want to be with family, they want to be on country, and they want birthing choices respected and care that's culturally safe and appropriate. In some places, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander women are, are virtually forced to leave their communities towards the end of their pregnancies. Respected Brisbane-based researcher, Professor Kilday, recently told me of an expectant mother in a remote community who said she wanted to delay her departure from her community by just one week. Their health providers threatened her and told her that if she did not get on that plane to be taken to the closest hospital, they would report her to Child Protection Services. This level of coercion being used on expectant Aboriginal mothers is shocking and reminiscent of what Australians would have hoped was a bygone era. Professor Kilday also told me of another distressing story of a hospital that discharged a new mum without telling her family and they put her on a long bus ride home. So when that new mum arrived in town at 3am, there was no one there to meet her. She had no means of contacting anyone to pick her up. So what could she do at 3am? She walked for an hour with her new baby to get home. If services are not culturally safe, if they are not providing health care that meets the needs of our people, then what value are we getting for our investment? Our nation requires champions for action on the wider determinants of health. Aboriginal people make up 3% of the population. We need the other 97% to champion this with us. I trust that the new Commissioner for Rural Health will be a champion of change and see beyond the mountain like my childhood neighbour, Mr Brad Walker. I trust the Commissioner will be a champion for improving health systems and services while recognising the needs to address key areas like poverty, inequality, racism and prejudice. It is these wider issues that continue to plague and burden the health of Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. Let us make the best use of an extraordinary Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health workforce sector. Let us make the best use of the wealth of Indigenous knowledges that has helped sustain us for thousands of years. Australia, let us utilise these valuable assets to improve the health of our nation. A 
I look forward to meeting with the new Commissioner for Rural Health and working together to do just this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Janine. Now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Martin Laverty. I too acknowledge the traditional owners of this great land on which we meet today. I pay my respects to Elders past and present and all First Australians present for this discussion today, most notably Auntie Matilda. Last evening I spoke to Jean Hildebrand. Uh, he's watching from Alice Springs today. He told me his story of a little while ago driving from Alice Springs to his work at Pine Gap and feeling, in his words, a little bit crook. He did the right thing on arrival at work and reported to the medical officer who suggested he might be in the early stages of a heart attack. He was taken into Alice Springs Hospital where emergency department doctor Chris Edwards told him that his heart attack had started and he required a stenting procedure, the types of which was only available in Adelaide. Flight nurse at the Royal Flying Doctors base at Adelaide Airport, at, sorry, at Alice Springs Airport, Carol Ilmer, welcomed Jean on arrival. It was at that stage that his heart would stop for the first time. In fact, his heart would stop six times as he was being loaded into the aircraft. As pilot Mark Haldine prepared the aircraft for departure, Jean would be kept alive through defibrillator shocks, through CPR, that would continue through the three-hour flight down to Adelaide, where Dr Chris and flight nurse Carol kept him alive such that he was alive on presentation for his stenting procedure in Adelaide. It wasn't until the ECG report was assessed after Jean had been moved into the ambulance that Carol recognised his heart had stopped 50 four times. He had been shocked back to life 54 times. I'm delighted that Jean is not only alive, but alive and well, <laughs> and hopefully enjoying this final moment in the spotlight uh, in Alice Springs today, and that his work colleagues don't rip him too much for my retelling of this story. Heart attack survival rates are worse in the bush than they are in the city. I acknowledge uh, John Kelly, the CEO of the Heart Foundation here today, and research that he released in September of this year found that in remote parts of the Northern Territory, there are 161 admissions for heart attack to hospitals per 10,000 people. Now that compares in the eastern and northern suburbs of Sydney to only 33 admissions per 10,000 people. Let me put that another way. The admission rate for heart attacks in the remote parts of the Northern Territory is five times that which it is on the northern and eastern suburbs of Sydney. I acknowledge Warren Snowden here today, the representative for the Northern Territory. He knows how important it is to take action on addressing this disparity. Pick a statistic, in fact, pick any statistic. Health outcomes are worse in the bush than they are in the city. A country resident will die on average two and a half years earlier than someone who lives in the city. Mortality rate from type 2 diabetes are 3.7 times higher in remote parts of Australia. You are four times more likely to die in a road vehicle accident on a country road than you are in the city. And suicide rates are seven times higher in country Australia. Social factors, the social determinants of health, play a major role in these disparities. But so too does poor access to healthcare services. A country Australian will see a doctor at half the rate of someone who lives in the city. They'll see a medical specialist or a dentist at a third of the rate. They'll see mental health professionals at only a fifth of the rate of someone who lives in the city. Why do we accept these stunning disparities? Why don't country Australians complain more? Why is it decision makers are able to avoid accountability for not addressing these disparities? Well, Jean's experience tells us that there are actions that can be taken. 
Those of us who work in the rural health sector, sometimes ourselves, have become numb to these disparities, as though there is little that we can do. But we know that in the 1990s, the difference in survival rates from heart attack in country hospitals compared to city hospitals in South Australia was 1.7. You were 1.7 times more likely to die of a heart attack if you were admitted to a country hospital in South Australia. In the decade from 2000, the integrated clinical cardiovascular care network, headed by South Australian cardiologist Phil Tiedemann, was able to improve the care and coordination by linking city-based cardiologists with clinicians in country hospitals so that patients were being diagnosed sooner, they were receiving drug interventions earlier, and they were being flown into capital cities for health care when their circumstances required. The Medical Journal of Australia reported in 2014 that the introduction of the cardiovascular care network and this linking of city and bush in South Australia had closed the life expectancy gap for those admitted with heart attacks in country SA hospitals compared to the city. The 30-day survival rate for myocardial infarction in country hospitals is now the same in city as it is in bush. This change was made with no new money. It was made by healthcare clinicians being able to better relate and better coordinate the resources that they have. We've come as the National Rural Health Alliance today to encourage the government in their design of the new Office of Rural Health Commissioner. We want the Rural Health Commissioner to succeed. And the first priority that the government has elected for the Rural Health Commissioner is a good one. The focus on developing pathways for rural GPs is a fantastic starting point. But it can't be the only performance indicator for the Rural Health Commissioner. Surely the Rural Health Commissioner should be focused on overcoming these disparities and having better health as their outcome. To do that in five years from now, we would think success for the Rural Health Commissioner would ensure that there was flexible access to primary health care across all parts of this nation that in fact commits itself to universal access to health care. This will require action on new health technologies. It will require us to address the potential for all health professionals to work to their scope of practice. But it also requires funding certainty, long-term funding certainty rather than the short-term chip-chop contracts that so often involve so many of us in unnecessary red tape. The Rural Health Commissioner needs to address the workforce distribution challenge. Australia's been terrific at enhancing the supply of health professionals such that in the years ahead, we're actually looking at an oversupply of some professions. Our challenge is they're not all turning up in the right places to work when they're needed. And the Rural Health Commissioner must find the path so that our health practitioners can work in the bush where they're so desperately needed. We also need the Rural Health Commissioner to be judged on whether or not they tackle why our health prevention programs in country Australia so often fail. What works in the city so rarely is successful in the bush. We know that the best way of treating an illness is to prevent it from happening in the first place. Yet there's pockets of Australia where our health prevention infrastructure has simply failed. We also need the Rural Health Commissioner to be the champion for social determinants of health. When I last spoke in this place, I was able to indicate that there was bipartisan support. The Liberals, the Greens and the Labor Party have each in 2013 agreed Australia should implement the World Health Organisation's action plan on social determinants. Three years on from that address, we're still waiting for action on social determinants to be taken. Above all, the main KPI for the Rural Health Commissioner is to ensure that we no longer accept, as both the rural health sector but also the Australian community, the disparity in health outcome and health access that exists between city and bush. When governments and electors alike are no longer willing to numbly accept these differences in health outcome, the Rural Health Commissioner 
will have succeeded. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Martin, and thank you to all of our speakers. Let's uh, open up the discussion now. Um, I'd like to ask you, if I may, uh, first, uh, Jerry, you, you talked first of all about telehealth, and I, I think you raised concerns that some city-based bureaucrats, um, some perhaps in, uh, in this town, uh, might see telehealth as a, as, as a panacea. Um, can you just expand on that? Do you think there is a risk that uh, some might see technology as, as overcoming some of the workforce distribution issues? and challenges that, that all three of you have raised. Can I ask you just to address that issue first of all, please? Yeah, I think, Steve, that's exactly right, that sometimes it is seen as a panacea, you know, that we'll replace on-the-ground services with technology. And, and it is important that we have the technology, and it has made great advances. Mind you, you know, connecting with the bush in, in um, innovative ways is not new, you know. Those of us who have had a long association with the Flying Doctor Service, you know, all know about Alf Traeger and his... Uh, um, communicating in the bush, you know, so it's been there for a long time and people in the bush have been reliant on it. So it's an adjunct only. Mm. And we can do great things. And I know there are many um, health services in, in rural and remote Australia who have that great connectivity with um, access to specialist services in the cities. And that is fan fantastic for isolated health professionals. It's a backup which they so vitally need. And it might just, op it is often just a matter of getting good advice so that even the patient can stay in the community and doesn't have to be transferred. But the thing is, I think the risk is we all feel that um, sometimes it is saying, well, you know, we don't need so many um, people on the ground out there to provide a health workforce. We can do it remotely. And, um, and we know there's no substitution for good face-to-face -face primary health care. Janine, would you, would you like to expand? Thank you. Would you like to expand on, on Jerry's comments? Do you agree with uh, the sentiment that she expresses? No, oh, absolutely. Um, you know, in terms of telehealth, it's an innovative way to, to go forward and to utilise our workforce that ex exists in the bush. Um, however, the infrastructure, the training for Aboriginal community controlled services certainly have to be there as well. And I pick on, up on um, Jerry's point about it, it doesn't um, forego the importance of having face-to-face -face consults. Building relationships with health services and health professionals is extremely important for our community yes. in particular. Okay. Martin, if I could just ask you, we, we, you, you talked a bit about, uh, well, quite a lot about workforce and distribution. You said there's actually an oversupply, if I interpret your remarks correctly, there's an oversupply of health professionals. What needs to be done then to address these distribution problems that you and, and, and the other speakers have, have raised? What would you like to see the commissioner or the government or, or others uh, do to address that problem? Well, there's been countless uh, studies into what it is that motivates uh, a health professional to actually reside in country Australia. And it might surprise you uh, that it's the social circumstance, it's the family, it's the ability to have kids in school and all of the amenity that all of us take for granted uh, who live in city that are so important to being able to have uh, a confidence to live in a country town. But most importantly, certainty. Certainty that health services uh, that exist in country towns are going to have the support that they need. The cardiovascular clinical care network in South Australia that I referred to, I do so very deliberately because it shows that you can be a, a nurse at a nurse outpost, you can be a doctor in a country town, but you're part of something wider, that you're part of a wider school of, of clinical thought. So it's one thing to encourage doctors, nurses, health professionals into a country town. They have to be looked after and remunerated properly. But we've also got to make sure that those supports, both social supports and clinical supports, are in place. And I think that's the, the starting point for the Rural Health Commissioner. Now, our, our contribution here today, Steve, is to encourage the government in this endeavour of the Rural Health Commissioner, but to think about it more broadly, that the starting point of just developing the pathway for rural GPs is not enough that we need to be quite clear and say the object of the Rural Health Commissioner should be better health outcomes for country Australians in years ahead. And that should be articulated in very firm targets. And I'm delighted that in the discussions that we as the Rural Health Alliance have had with government, opposition and crossbench in Senate, uh, that they're very aware of this potential to set up some real tangible deliverables for the Rural Health Commissioner. Thank you. Uh, we have a question from Simon Gross. Uh, Simon Gross, <coughs> excuse me. Simon Gross, Canberra IQ. I was privileged last Thursday to be in this room when we heard from uh, Marcia Langton 
uh, Katrina Price and um, uh, Josephine Cashman about the scourge of domestic violence in remote in Indigenous communities. Um, it was one of the most galvanising presentations I've seen in this room. I've seen in this room, and I recommend if people didn't see it, they should they, they should find it on iView. Uh, it was also one of the more depressing, one of the most depressing presentations I've I've attended, because they were actually arguing to raise the incarceration rates of Indigenous people, because they wanted to see um, violent men and child abusing men in Indigenous communities put away, which of course sets up a whole wave of, uh, of well-being and health problems in terms of role models down the generations. Um, so I've, that's the context. Uh, can you, as rural health uh, representatives of the rural health uh, providers, quantify or describe how uh, domestic violence in remote Aboriginal communities shapes how uh, resources are apportioned um, and, uh, and uh, perhaps skewed. And do you have any insights into a solution to this problem apart from raising the incarceration rates? I'll start. <coughs> Thank you for your question. Um, absolutely, domestic violence happens in Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander communities. Um, I think what Marcia and the panel also highlighted last week was that there are programs that work programs in communities that work. So we can put as much investment into communities, but if it's not in the right place, if it's not in programs that are evidence-based, that are having outcomes, um, we're not gonna get the desired need that we want. It's, it's a long-term issue, and it's not, going to, it's not going to be fixed quickly. Um, it's like anything on the spectrum of the close the gap issues across the social determinants of health, which is why we're calling on the Commissioner to look at the social determinants of health. It, it, it's not a, a quick fix. It requires um, partnership and it certainly requires uh, a relationship with communities. When Aboriginal people are at the centre of the development, delivery and evaluation of programs, we know that they work. Um, and in terms of funding distribution, I think I'll um, ask my learned colleagues to maybe comment on that one. Tomor tomorrow, the Flying Doctors will release research uh, that shows uh, an Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander is 1.8 times more likely to die of an injury than a non-Indigenous Australian. Uh, the top reason that the Royal Flying Doctor Service retrieves Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islanders from remote communities is in response to injury. And injury includes the consequence of violence, uh, domestic violence in particular. You'll appreciate that it's very expensive and very heartbreaking for a Royal Flying Doctor Service aircraft to ever be dispatched <coughs> to respond to an injury arising from violence. And the staff of the Flying Doctors, many of whom I acknowledge in this room today, uh, do that all the time. We call on all governments to take that action that it can, which necessarily requires money, to attend to and prevent violence in communities, not just for the prevention of violence itself, but so that our health resources might be freed up for other. That while ever we as the flying doctors don't comment and don't lend our support to the Close the Gap agenda, we're simply not doing our job. Jerry, would you like to? Oh, I don't really have anything else to add. I think um, Janine made the very, you know, relevant point that, again, about what services are provided, be that to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander communities, it needs to be from the ground up. It is, again, local solutions that are going to meet the needs of the people, not particularly other models that might have worked elsewhere and try and translate that into situations where it's not appropriate. Question from Tony Melville. Uh, Tony Melville, Director of the National Press Club. Um, a, a suggestion and a, a, a comment and a question first. Um, may, uh, look at uh, Farmer Wants a Wife. Maybe you need a <laughs> get on the reality show doctor bandwagon. Doctor Wants a Wife. Town, <laughs> town needs a doctor. You know, just a suggestion. Are you pitching this, Tony? Is I'm pitching it. I'm pitching it. Someone might take Is it there up. Is any producers out there? Yeah, there could be. Um, but just on the question of 457 visas are getting a lot of bad press at the moment and uh, one of the biggest users of 457 visas people don't realise are state governments with doctors and nurses. Now, um, what are your views on uh, 457 visas and uh, are they essential for the bush and, um, you know, just generally what, what are your views, attitudes to them? 
Mr Laverty, do you want to kick things off? Mr Lewis, the health sector has relied on uh, immigration to plug gaps in our health system around the country for many years, and thank goodness for that, because if we didn't have the supply of health professionals from other parts of the world to attend to parts of our country where we don't have sufficient uh, personnel, we would be in a real pickle. So any efforts that changes the opportunity for the free movement of health professionals in and out of country Australia is going to disadvantage us. But the real challenge now is reaping the benefit of the investment that Australia has made over the last 20 years. We went from having three um, rural medical schools in Australia to now having, I think, 14. And as a consequence, we are producing more doctors, more nurses, pleasingly more dentists. We need to encourage and put in place the supports so that they're not only willing, but they actually want to go and work in country Australia. That starts during training. The importance of exposing health professionals during their training experience to a placement within a country area where they appreciate the stunning opportunity of living far from the traffic of metropolitan Sydney and Melbourne. Once we've got that in place and we ensure that there are the professional support networks, we can do a much better job at attracting health professionals and retaining them in the bush. And then this issue of 457 would become less important to us. Can I just make a comment? Sorry, yes, just in, I have a colleague in the room, a midwife, who gets very anxious about the lack of midwives in the country. She wanted to run a program that said every farmer needs a midwife. <laughs> Tony, there's a, there are, there's some symmetry happening here. Jerry, can I just ask you, what's the, what's the, the view of your organisation about, about 457? Do you agree with Martin that it's, it's necessary? Yeah, that and we it don't have the, mm. the homegrown medical and health um, uh, expertise? Is well, not anymore, I don't think. You know, that was certainly a situation that we had in terms of, and it was an absolute necessity to get yeah. a workforce. Um, but um, we all, I think, agree now we, we have got a... Um, a supply of a workforce and it's absolutely <coughs> imperative that we um, that we utilise them better and get them out to the bush because it is that thing about um, it's not only getting them there, it's keeping them there <coughs> and people are more likely to stay there I think if we certainly grow our own but I think that's the important factor that we now don't have that issue anymore, it has been and you know it might well be again but not at the moment. Yeah, Janine do you have anything further to add? Sure. Um, I think building on, I am the CEO of the Congress of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Nurses and Midwives, so I think building on the success that I spoke about in my speech, building on those 3,000 existing Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Nurses and Midwives as role models for yeah. young kids that are in the bush that don't think that they're smart enough to ever be a nurse, maybe a AFL footballer or maybe a, you know, a runner, but they don't think that they're smart enough to be a nurse or a midwife. And we know if we take kids from the bush and um, they want to become health professionals, they more often than not go back there. Um, on the broader issue of um, the visa, I think that anyone coming to work in um, Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander communities, as I said, need to undertake cultural safety training so that they understand how to work best with our people. Um, so, and, and, and that's across the, um, the health workforce spectrum itself. Okay. Thank, thank you. Our next question is from Peter Phillips. Uh, Peter Phillips, one of the directors of the National Press Club. Thank you very much for your addresses today. Uh, in uh, opening uh, my remarks and in leading into my question, I want to endorse a remark made by an earlier questioner about the profound impact, the profound effect, which uh, everybody in this uh, auditorium and all of the broadcast audience, I'm sure, felt from the addresses only a week ago by Marcia Langton, Jacinta Price and Josephine Cashman in relation to the issue of, uh, uh, of domestic violence. Um, uh, Leading on from that uh, and, and to your addresses today, I just want to ask, and initially and particularly to Janine, I want to ask you if you could reflect a little bit further. In the period between last week and this week, we saw uh, the remarks made by Noel Pearson, uh, a man who's very well known in this, in, this, in this institution and very well known across the community. Uh, and I wondered if you might perhaps offer some thoughts, some reflections, some comments perhaps on the frustration, the uh, annoyance which Noel was appearing to, to uh, express. Uh, do you see, do you feel, do you experience some of the frustration, some of the annoyances, some of the limitations which Noel seemed to be reflecting on? Or was it just Noel being Noel? <laughs> Um, Noel made some comments about ABC and first and foremost up front I'd like to say I'm very happy to be on the ABC today. Um, <laughs> I, 
I suppose they, um, looking at what Noel was highlighting, it was really about a strengths-based approach to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples. And we see it within our organisations, and I've already mentioned it, where we go and talk to young Aboriginal kids in communities, they, um, there's an underestimation of us as a community, as a population. And these kids absorb that underestimation. And they don't believe that they're smart enough to, to be a nurse, to... to you know, to be a, a health professional. But equally yoked the, with that, and I think what the ABC does is it talks about the historical events that have happened and that how that actually impacts on Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander um, health statistics that we see today. One might call it a black armband um, type of debate. Um, I believe it's a debate that needs to be had. And as a nation, if we don't have a collected history, if we have a divided history, we will never be one nation. So I also want to highlight, um, when I reflected on that, I thought 25 years ago, we would not have seen Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people on the TV. I'm here. Um, and, you know, or even having Aboriginal um, affairs discussed. So, and I think that's a great thing, that we have, um, you know, national dialogue about our First Nations peoples. Martin? Yeah. Some of the health professionals that work for the Royal Flying Doctor Service have shared with me the stories of providing uh, healthcare services uh, to people in communities who within their lifetime uh, it was the role of government to come and take children from those families. They're deeply suspicious of government institutions, of non-government institutions. For those of us who work within the Royal Flying Doctor Service, uh, if we don't acknowledge that, if we don't comment on it and do our bit to ensure that the service we provide in communities is not only culturally safe, but aware to why so many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today still struggle to interact with government institutions or non-government institutions like our own. It's our job as a non-Indigenous organisation to stand with Aboriginal organisations, the community controlled sector, and say we do need to discuss these views that still exist, are still prevalent and indeed still prevent people from getting access to the healthcare services that they need. It might sound unusual for me to need to draw attention to it, but by the Flying Doctors acknowledging, I encourage other organisations that are not necessarily uh, purely Indigenous focused to ensure their cultural sensitivity, because this presents as the main cultural determinant of health. We won't close the gap until we have cultural safety properly understood across the entire Australian healthcare system. Jerry, do you have anything to add? Oh, no, only that I would just reinforce that all the member organisations of the National Rural Health Alliance are united in that view, that it's about inclusivity and, and supportive and acknowledge the, our um, Indigenous colleagues and the organisations that have the voice. Thank you. Ken Randall. Uh, Ken Randall from my centre. Could I take all of you back to the basic rationale for this event today? Um, how do you think... I assume the legislation will pass. I can't see any real obstacle to it in the parliament. But once that happens, how should the government go about selecting the commissioner? And what should the commissioner, once selected, do about going about priorities? So I think we'd suggest um, a bit of agnostic approach to the selection, who it is and how. Um, I'd be delighted to see uh, a female commissioner appointed I'd be delighted to see a strong Aboriginal presence within the appointment to that role. So perhaps I'm not as agnostic as I started off to be. <laughs> but the objective should be that there are clearly established targets for this Rural Health Commissioner just beyond the government's initial good idea, which is that of a generalist pathway for rural GPs. If we don't see within legislation a target around improving health outcome and overcoming the disparity, we can point to other jurisdictions internationally where health equity is embedded in legislation that commits health departments, that commits governments broadly to addressing health inequity. Now, I'm aware that that's not what the government necessarily has as its first priority for the Rural Health Commissioner. But our discussion today has been about overcoming the disparity that exists in life expectancy and quality of life between city and bush. 
So the way you do that in a legislative sense is to embed this concept of health equity. We want to see the same health outcome for someone if they live in a capital city or a country town. If that's the KPI, the Rural Health Commissioner, whoever is appointed to it, will be set up to succeed. Jerry Miller. I think um, the who, of course, is critical. Um, and um, I'm sure that many different people have many different views. But the important thing is that the person who is in that role understands the sector. You know, they're credible to the sector um, and has the um, ability to forge relationships and, and move forward with the job. And, an, and it will need to be a super person because all that we're wanting them to do, you know, is, is enormous, really. And I think in, in terms of how do we um, influence, it's about listening to us all. Listening to us all who understand the context of rural and remote health. And there's a lot of expertise in this room um, as a, through the National Rural Health Alliance. And so it's about really having some clear... Um, performance indicators um, to move towards the outcomes that we think is absolutely essential for rural and remote people. No, I think I'd quite simply say to come and talk to the experts, the National <laughs> Rural Health Alliance. Um, and also, you know, valuing our workforce obviously has to be on mm. uh, the Commissioner's agenda. How hopeful are you? To just let's, let's talk a bit more about this role and, and, and the, this person um, who will be appointed uh, sometime next year if legislation goes through. How confident are you, all, all three of you, that it will be a bipartisan uh, appointment or a non-partisan appointment that the politics will be taken out of it? Because after all, it was, correct me if I'm wrong, it was a coalition election pledge. There's not a lot of bipartisanship in this current parliament. How confident are you that this role, which is a critical role going forward, will be as best possible in a non-partisan okay. stance? I've seen um, bipartisan support in, yep. uh, in Aboriginal health. Yep. More recently, the National Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Health Plan, um, a plan that had unprecedented consultations, uh, and it started with the Honourable Minister Warren Snowden. Um, and you know that was taken up by the next government. So we um, we have hope that there will be bipartisan support. Look, our understanding and our yeah. hope is that the commission is established by statute statute provides the support for independence and it's then up to the person that might be appointed or indeed people if it's broader than just the one. So providing that, that statutory support is there, I'd have every confidence that once appointed uh, someone should be independent. Jerry? Yeah, I don't think we have any reason to concern that it would not be bipartisan. You know, we get equal support from all political parties. It's, you know, I don't think that's a major concern. Okay. Next question is from Morris Riley. Thanks, Thanks Stephen. Um, well, the last two questions have sort of been taken, so I'll, I'll continue on in that theme. Thank you, gentlemen. Um, the, the, the appointment of a commission or a commissioner, um, I just wonder whether you think this is going to be, it might end up another layer of bureaucracy. Um, you know, the battle that everyone has is uh, getting your message through to Canberra, and that's uh, uh, the bureaucracy, and uh, you've, also, you've also got funding that probably comes across federal and local uh, and state rather. Um, I just wonder whether this is going to be um, another layer of complexity that gets in the way of getting the job done. Um, why is the rural alliance very supportive of the proposal to introduce another layer? Having a commissioner <laughs> is better than having no commissioner. Because at the moment, the complexity that you're perhaps suggesting would follow is our life anyway. If anything, we see the opportunity to draw attention. Mm. There hasn't really been a focus on rural health since about 1996, when there was a significant investment into the expansion of medical schools in particular that saw resources directed to health in the bush. And since that time, it's perhaps been steady as she goes. This is the first time in a long time that we've seen a commitment of government to take a new and bold step uh, for a focus around health equity within country Australia. So when you get those rare opportunities, you grab onto them and you support government, it would be very easy for us to come here and throw stones. Instead, we're saying the idea is great, but it has to have a broad focus. It's got to focus on better health outcomes. Otherwise, I think it will turn in. It risks being exactly what you've suggested if it doesn't have that overarching goal. Mm. Janine, are you worried that uh, it'll be just another layer of bureaucracy? 
I think it's easy to throw stones, and I remain <laughs> optimistic like Martin. Um, but we do see that bureaucracy in Aboriginal health, you know, takes up a, or absorbs a large amount of funding. There's a misnomer in, a, in Australia that um, Aboriginal health gets thrown a lot of money. But when we actually look at how much money Aboriginal health actually gets um, at the coalface, we find that, you know, there's a, there's a real lack of on-the-ground funding. There's a real lack of services that actually get to Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander people. So, yes, I, I see the concerns. I understand that layers of bureaucracy sometimes don't help the most, most vulnerable, but I'm remaining uh, positive. Jerry Malone, I mean, how important will it be for the Commissioner, the Commission to be perhaps uh, located outside of Canberra or outside of a capital city, in fact? Oh, that's an interesting one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and would you like to nominate her? Yeah. <laughs> I'd like to nominate where? Um, sure. Look, I think sometimes, you know, that, um, that idea is, um, you know, so that you've got to be out in the bush to be effective in the bush. But the reality is that you've got to be where the decision makers are. You've got to be, you know, there to be seen. There's a saying, um, another colleague who says, if you're not around the table, you're probably on the menu. Mm. <laughs> and, and I think that's really important, and, and we all know that, that, you know, like, if you're not there, if you're not present, um, and, and I think, unfortunately, we have to be where the decision-makers are. But I think we, we can be confident about um, these sorts of things, and it's up to us collectively, organisations and communities, I would say, to keep them accountable. Hmm. Uh, we have another question from Simon Gross. Uh, Simon Gross, Canberra IQ. Um, uh, Martin, you talked about the explosion in... Um, uh, regional or rural health uh, um, schools. Um, and uh, I remember David Gillespie, the recently new Minister for, I think, Regional Health is his title, putting out a release a couple of weeks ago saying that uh, there's going to be 7,000 more doctors in Australia by, I think, 2020 or 2030 or something. 30. 2030. So you've got a supply side opportunity, you guys. Uh, you talked about getting students out to remote places or rural places to attract them, but that can sometimes turn them off. <laughs> I'm just wondering if you've got this supply side opportunity, are there strategies being built up to try and drag people out to the, to the bush uh, as they can't find a job in the city? I fear not everyone in the room agrees with you that uh, <laughs> those, those who live and work uh, in country Australia uh, once there uh, tend to fall in love with it and stay. Mm. I look at the, the very long tenure of many who work with the Royal Flying Doctor Service, uh, who have met their partners through the Royal Flying Doctor Service, have had their families in country towns. And once that social network is in place, it becomes very easy to stay. Working in country areas is a very attractive and presentable life. It just has a few challenges that can be addressed. And providing those social and clinical support networks, the opportunity for ongoing professional development, and of course remuneration, if all of those issues are tested and put in place, uh, I'm confident that we'll see uh, that um, uh, turn up of health professionals in the bush where they're needed. But it requires the will of government to continue and not be satisfied with those measures that are in place today that bonded students that go through medical school and spend their time in country areas tend to stay on. But not all do, and we have to find the opportunities to incentivise them to do so. I, I look at this glass half full rather than empty. The oversupply is the opportunity we have been looking for. It just needs a leader, and our suggestion is that that leader is the Rural Health Commissioner. Janine, do you want to...? Um. I would say that, you know, the, in the field of nursing, we know that we have 130,000 um, workforce shortage by 2030. So that needs some concerted effort. Um, we should all be worried in Australia that that's the case. Um, what we at Congress of Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander Nurses have called for is a national strategy for a, uh, a workforce strategy for Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander nurses, something that sets out the strategic directions for us as an organisation and has great indicators in it as well so that we can actually track our progress. But as I said earlier, we have 3,000 Aboriginal Torres Strait Islander nurses, but we're only 1% of the health workforce. So, you know, that's something for us to improve upon. Jerry? I think, um, just like to reinforce it, you know, again, it's about the whole workforce and we have to find ways of making sure that all areas of the workforce, be they medical, allied health, nursing, midwifery, um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health professionals, that they're all encouraged and supported 
to work in the bush because we need everybody out there and it's not mm. just one group that's going to fix it for us. Ladies and gentlemen, let's conclude on that note. Ladies and I know you'll agree with me when you uh, say that we've had uh, a really interesting uh, debate over the past hour. We've, uh, we've talked about the, the role of the Commission. We've talked about the challenges facing, uh, facing all three of you and your organisations. Congratulations. We've even come up with one or two ideas for TV shows. So for <laughs> TV uh, producers out there, uh, we can uh, provide contact details. Um, ladies and gentlemen, please join with me in thanking Janine Mohammed, Jerry Malone and Martin Laverty. Of course, at the National Press Club, you never go away empty-handed. Uh, we will provide all of you with a special membership and a copy of Stand and Deliver, which is a sort of highlights package of our first 50 years. I think we're 53 years young. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please thank our speakers again. Thank you very much. ...out there, and that there was...